In June of 2008, ATI had caught lightning in a bottle with their HD4870, offering performance equivalent to that of NVIDIA's GTX 260 at a much lower price. Released alongside it, though, was their ultimate card for value seekers, the Radeon HD4850. To start off, we'll get into the specs of the Radeon HD4850. It's using a slightly cut down RV770 GPU dubbed RV770 Pro, which has 800 shading units and is clocked at 625 MHz. Its VRAM configuration consists of 512MB of GDDR3 clocked at a fast 993MHz, which is running on a 256-bit bus making for a total memory bandwidth of 64GB per second. As to be expected for a Terascale 1 card, modern API support is a little sparse with support for up to DirectX 10.1 and OpenGL 3.3. There's still a lot of applications that will run on this card, but this API support takes a lot of modern games out of the question. This card consumes a reasonable 110 watts, and as such requires one 6-pin PEG connector. With RV770, ATI had continued with their smaller size, lower cost die strategy whilst improving on numerous areas over its predecessor. The first and probably most important change was in raw execution resources. ATI scaled up their die quite a lot for RV770, packing 10 compute units for a total of 800 shading units, which was over double that of the previous RV670. Another great improvement here was ATI fixing poor AA performance on Terascale. Now, RV670 and R600 had the questionable method of forcing AA to run on the shader hardware, which robbed those two of shader performance causing them to perform very poorly with AA enabled. In RV770, ATI reworked their ROPS for hardware AA resolve, which as to be expected, greatly improved performance scaling with AA. In the end, the HD4870 and HD4850 offered a huge leap in performance over their predecessors while being priced similarly. But how did they stack up against NVIDIA's incredibly powerful GT200 cards? Well, actually they did good, very good in fact, as the HD4870 traded blows with NVIDIA's GTX 260 while being $100 cheaper. So, how about the HD4850? It made use of the same RV770 GPU as the HD4870, but with a couple of changes. Core clocks were 17% lower than its bigger brother, and the card came equipped with cheaper GDDR3 memory to keep costs down. As a result, the card offered around 80% of the performance of an HD4870 while being only $199 USD, which needless to say made the card amazing value compared to anything else on the market. As such, the HD4850 was a very popular choice for mid-range gamers of the time. In order to reach the high-end, ATI relied on Crossfire, which compared to the previous HD3000 series was much more viable, as two HD4850s in Crossfire would offer performance close to NVIDIA's mighty GTX 280 at a much lower cost. Keep in mind though that Crossfire still came with some issues, but for the most part, a lot of the major kinks from the last generation had been worked out. Not only that, thanks to being on the superior 55 nanometer node, the RV770 cards boasted fantastic performance per watt compared to NVIDIA's GT200. With history out of the way, let's take a look around the card itself. I purchased this HD4850 for 15 bucks online, and it originally came with an aftermarket Zalman cooler which I put on my Radeon X1900 XTX. As a result, this card didn't have a cooler until I put this Franken cooler on it. The heatsink is from a broken HD5850 I had lying around, and the fan came from a broken Intel stock cooler. It's a pretty janky solution, but it gets the job done as the GPU hardly gets above 60 degrees under full load. Also, I thought I'd mention this card is made by Diamond and is using the reference PCB. Now let's get into our overclock settings, and I settled for 700MHz on core, which represents a 12% jump to core frequencies over stock. Unfortunately, I couldn't get the memory to clock very high on this card, and I ended up settling at 1050MHz, which is a small 6% jump to memory frequencies. Keep in mind I'm using a modded BIOS that increases core voltages to 1.158 volts, which allowed for this overclock to be rock solid stable. Overall, this overclock is nothing too exciting and this card can almost certainly get higher, but we should still observe a minor performance uplift over stock clocks. So time to get into some testing. We'll be using my newly upgraded test system this time around, and its specs are on screen. All footage was captured from an external device so there's no hit to performance. Let's see how this old king of budget performance holds up in some games. 
First came up is CSGO, and here I use the 720p resolution with the low settings and shadows set to high. At stock, the card managed 93 FPS, with 1% lows down to 61. Overclocked, averages jumped 13% to 105 FPS, with 1% lows rising 5% to 64. Frame times were great, and interestingly enough, VRAM was fully saturated here. Out of the resolutions I tested in this game, 720p seemed to be the best here, as under 1080p this card would often dip below 50 FPS. Next up is a game I actually haven't shown in my benchmarks for a really long time now, Shift 2 Unleashed. I used the 720p resolution with the medium settings and AA set to normal. The 4850 managed averages of 45 FPS, with 1% lows down to 27. Overclocked averages jumped up 11% to 50 FPS, with 1% lows rising 15% to 31. For the benchmark, I selected a race during dusk, which seems to put the most load on the card. Overall, the card did pretty well here, with some micro stutter being felt, but nothing too bad. VRM wasn't used up very much here, so you could increase the texture quality with a minor hit to frame rates. Tomb Raider is up next, and here I used the built-in benchmark with the 720p resolution and the high settings with FXAA. The card averaged 39 FPS, with 1% lows down to 32. Overclocked averages jumped 10% to 43 FPS, with 1% lows rising 13% to 36. As to be expected, VRAM was pretty much fully utilized here. The experience was akin to that of a 7th generation console while looking a bit better here. The card did decently here, but still not as well as I would have expected. Next game up is Minecraft, and I chose the 1080p resolution with the fancy settings and a render distance of 14 chunks. At stock, the 4850 averaged 77 FPS, with 1% lows down to 30. Overclocked averages jumped 12% to 86 FPS, with 1% lows rising 10% to 33. For some reason, GPU utilization was only around 80%, so no clue what was happening there. Anyhow, the card offered a great experience here with some stutter when loading in chunks as to be expected. Next up is the infamous system killer from 2007, Crisis. Using the built-in benchmark, I selected the 1080p resolution with the medium preset with no AA. Our card managed averages of 54 FPS, with 1% lows down to 33. Overclocked averages jumped 6% to 57 FPS, with 1% lows also rising by 6% to 35. Frame times were a little inconsistent and some micro stutter was felt, but the card still did pretty well here. Next game up is an older but still iconic title, Half-Life 2. I used the 1080p resolution with the high settings and 8xAA. We managed averages of 163 FPS, with 1% lows down to 101. Overclocked averages rose 10% to 180 FPS, with 1% lows rising 14% to 115. I used the pretty intensive water hazard segment of the game for testing and it looked great and ran amazingly well, which made for a very nice experience overall. The final game for today is Just Cause 2, and using the built-in benchmark I chose the 1080p resolution with the low settings and no AA. We averaged 53 FPS, with 1% lows down to 32. Overclocked averages rose 8% to 57 FPS, with 1% lows rising 13% to 36. Frame rates were very good at the beginning of the benchmark, but it started to slow down a lot in the latter half, which is very heavy on effects. Now what really surprised me here was VRAM usage, as the game was only using about half of our VRAM throughout the benchmark. Looking at our benchmark results, it's evident that the HD4850 is a very nicely performing card overall, and it even does well in games made years after its release. When you consider that this card was being offered for just $199 USD, ATI was offering some amazing price to performance for the time. 
Sometime in the future, I'd love to see how this card stacks up against its bigger brother, the HD 4870, and seeing how much of a difference the higher clocks and GDDR5 memory makes. Anyhow, that'll be it for this video. Thank you all for watching. Like, comment, and subscribe, and I'll see you all in the next one.